In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> Clean feet are a luxury, especially back in the first century. We may take cleanliness for granted, but in Jesus' day, the city of Jerusalem was hot and dusty, teeming with people preparing for the seven-day Passover holiday of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. The unpaved streets were filled with people walking everywhere. Merchants were selling the prescribed foods. Travelers were looking for a place to stay. And the observant Jews were milling around discussing religious matters as the ever-present Roman soldiers were trying to keep order. The sun made it unbearably hot and the thick dust stuck to your feet and clothing, making it hard to breathe without choking. Jerusalem was filled to capacity in preparation for the holiday celebration. Into this crowd of humanity, Jesus sent a few of his disciples to procure a room for supper. He specifically wanted an upper room, above all that was happening on the streets below. Arrangements were made for the room, provisions were ordered for the supper, and all was made ready. Jesus understood that keeping the Passover rituals preserved the biblical conditions under which faith was both reenacted and continued as a perpetual ordinance. Jesus knew that tonight would be his last night with his disciples, safe and quietly together in one place. He also knew that tonight's events would begin unfolding a challenge that would change his disciples and an unknowing world forever. As was the custom, the disciples removed their sandals upon entering the upper room as they prepared to eat supper. A servant or a slave, upon granting them entrance to the upper room, had probably already washed the dust from their feet. As the disciples mingled, making small talk as they selected their seats, I can imagine these private conversations may have included banterings back and forth about who among them was greater, more important, or most worthy. Well, time was running out, and tonight would be critical. You see, Jesus realized that over the past few years together, the disciples had watched his compassion and love for the people. They had seen the many miracles he performed, and yet they did not understand that he was showing them what they must do when he was no longer with them. They had listened to his many parables and stories of love, compassion, and justice for all people, and yet it had not registered that Jesus wanted them to do the same thing when he was gone. Tonight, Jesus planned on drawing them into an understanding of exactly what he meant and exactly what they were to do. Even at this late point in their journey with Jesus, they still did not understand truly what Jesus was trying to teach them. And Jesus was well aware of their shortcomings. So tonight, he was going to teach them in a different manner, delivering his most important lesson yet. Tonight, he would be their servant. He would model his radical, subservient love to them. And they needed to learn and show this radical and subservient love to one another from that day forward. Everyone, including Judas Iscariot, was seated at a table enjoying supper. Before the meal ended, Jesus got up from the table, removed his outer robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and taking a basin of water, he began to wash their feet. Each disciple had his feet washed and towel dried by Jesus their Lord and Messiah. Of course, Peter spoke out in his objection, and Jesus quickly explained that this act of servanthood was necessary, and if he did not submit to it, he would no longer be one of his followers. As we all know, Peter agreed, and Jesus continued washing his feet, and eventually supper resumed. My question is this. How do we, along with Jesus' disciples, understand the significance of this foot washing. Jim Somerville, in his book, Feasting on the Word, puts it this way. 
Jesus removes the outer robe of his glory. He wraps around himself a towel of human flesh, suffers and dies for the sake of the world, reclothes himself with glory, and resumes his rightful place in the bosom of the Creator. You see, Jesus wanted them to understand that servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. Perhaps on the simplest level, serving others is a blessing. He knew that the disciples did not yet fully understand this message, but in time they would. Knowing he soon would be gone, Jesus blessed them and said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Ten Commandments that we know and follow are the first ten of 613 commandments given by God to the Jewish people. The first ten form the foundation of our ethics, as well as civil and religious laws. And now Jesus, the Son of God, gave us a new radical commandment to love one another. Just like the disciples, we don't really understand the true significance of what we are being asked to do. Loving one another on the surface sounds pretty easy to do. We've been trying to do that as Christians our whole life. As followers of Jesus, how are you and I to love and serve one another? We can begin with small, everyday acts of humble service to our family and friends, our neighbors and co-workers. Everyone we meet and pass by is worthy in the eyes of Jesus and therefore is to be loved and served by each of us. By continuing to feed the hungry in our community through our partnership with RISE, supporting Habitat in our local community by building homes, opening our building doors to the many groups that need a place to serve their special needs communities, and accepting people and organizations that can benefit from the love of Christ are all examples of what we do today at St. David's. We also love and serve our church family in so many meaningful ways. We are connected to one another through our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is a wonderful blessing. Our acts of kindness and love and service all come from somewhere. It goes deeper than our DNA, deeper than our parents and our upbringing and the environment. I look to the sacrament of baptism to help me answer the source of our many gifts. At our baptism, the Holy Spirit bestowed gifts upon each of us. So in essence, we have within us the acknowledged gifts to do the very work we're called to do. Each of our gifts are unique, and they allow us to reach out and share the word and love of Jesus. One last time to quote, to quote Jim Somerville, he says, just as baptism inaugurates us into Jesus' ministry of tending the wounds of a broken world, we too are in need of the ongoing washing of Jesus and the bathing of our own weary feet if we are to have the strength, compassion, and the spirit to continue that ministry in the world. In closing, let us pray for one another, for our individual calls to love and serve Christ, and above all, the inspirational gift of simply having clean feet. Amen. Amen.